Hey everybody, I'm Dustin, I'm an alcoholic. So I originally turned this gig down, but it started out as a request and it turned out to be a suggestion by my sponsors, so <laughs> I'm here. Uh, so I started, I grew up in San Diego, California. Um, both my parents were alcoholics and addicts. Uh, my mom, she was a pretty heavy drinker and she was big into crank. My, my dad was like this returned Vietnam vet and a heavy, heavy drinker that he was the kind of drinker that had to keep it going. There was no, there was no day off, you know. He used to start the morning with uh, these, those little bottles, he called them pocket rockets, you know, and he'd shoot that down every day. If he, if he didn't, he'd go into seizures, you know. Um, most of the time I spent, I spent with my mom. She was uh, down in San Diego. We, uh, our home base was at my grandpa's house. Um, she was in and out of relationships this and that, but the main, the main spot would be my grandpa's. That's where my grandpa was, was quite the enabler for her. She would, she would be able to go, come and go as she pleases, um, do pretty much what she wants. And she knew that at least I had an adult supervision there. He wasn't, he wasn't the best, you know, I mean, as far as keeping up on me, brushing my teeth or good clothes and stuff, but he would cook dinner. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I remember back, I was kind of that dirty, stinky kid going to school and stuff. My, I lived with my older sister, and uh, she's about two, two and a half years older than me, and she, she kind of took on the, the caretaker role best she could, and I mean, pretty much throughout my whole life she did. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's how things started off. My mom uh, worked at a restaurant down there called Aunt Emma's, and this place, um, it was a restaurant connected to a bar, and so... Um, most of the time she would work her shift and at the end of her shift she'd just head over to the bar till closing so I didn't I didn't spend a lot a lot of time with her as much as I wanted I've always been a mama's boy no matter what she was up to but uh one of the strongest memories I have is is uh how she used to come home in the middle of the night and we shared a room at my grandpa's house so I would uh the smell of alcohol and cigarettes was just so potent it would like it was hard to fall back asleep and that that was the that was kind of the start, and then uh, there was uh, I mean she she we'd move in and out with quite a quite a few different people. I, I remember uh, vividly we we moved in with a guy she started seeing that was our that was a drug dealer, and uh, it's it's a pretty vivid memory. I remember it was me and my sister. We were playing early morning and. Uh, we were looking out the window and we were the only ones up. There was a guy crashed out on the couch and everybody else was sleeping in the back and all these cars are pulling up and these guys in yellow coats and guns are running up to the door and we were like looking out the window and they wave at us, point the door and my sister lets them in. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, then as soon as they came in screaming, uh, we were in the air getting hauled out and they were telling me it was a fire. And I, uh, I remember looking for the fire and seeing everybody come out in handcuffs, and that was the first little separation I had from my mom. Her, she went to jail, uh, her boyfriend went to prison, and uh, my grandpa came and got me again. And um, my grandpa was, uh, as far back as I can remember, the only man for a lot of years that, was, uh, that I trusted that, that didn't scare me. Um, yeah, and anyhow, so um, as time went, you know, my mom, when she came back in the picture, she was, uh, she was back at work, you know, doing her thing. And uh, things didn't change for a while till, till she met this guy. See, Aunt Emma's used to hold this AA meeting there. And um, she met a guy that was pursuing her, her pretty hard. And, and she had her little prerequisites. She used to tell me that, you know, she doesn't want to be poor with a man. She can be poor by herself. So one of her requisites was that, you know, you got to have money. And that was the main prerequisite, really, because, like, looking back at some of the guys she was with, I mean, she it, that's the only thing that mattered, I guess, at the point. And, and this guy kind of dazzled her. He had been sober for quite a few years, and um, he had money. He had everything we wanted. We wanted to move out of my little, uh, my grandpa's little place. He even had one of those box cell phones in his car, you know, that was, I'm old. It was, like, that big, and... Um, <laughs> I thought he was like a movie. I thought he was rich, you know, and, and I didn't know really what we were getting into, but that was the beginning of, of a huge change in life. He, uh, we moved in with him. He, uh, he was uh, about six foot two, 250 pounds, um, about 12 years older than her, and he was a disciplinarian. He was a, I went from um, zero to discipline, pretty much just 
running around playing and being a, I wouldn't say normal kid because I had zero supervision, you know, I didn't get any structure whatsoever um, to this man that demanded perfection out of me immediately. And, um, and the consequences were pretty bad too, you know, he was quite abusive. He, uh, he would, uh, he installed a shitload of fear, but, but still, this is, this is the alcoholic in me. I, I, I still never conformed. I was still <laughs> not able to, you know, make my bed perfect or even remember to, uh, I, I couldn't get the schooling right. Um, and, and those were the big things, you know, and I, I often wonder if things would have been different if I was able to conform because my sister did. My sister was a top notch student. She's always been pretty successful and she's just been about it. And, um, and I've been the opposite. I've been, uh, if the stricter shit was at home, the more, the more I would explode away from home, the more I would uh, have fun at school. You know, I, I, got use, I got used to being in trouble, so I found ways around it. And, um, and it was like that for quite a few years. I, I remember um, it went on like that for quite a few years, but it got so bad, like, that, like, I remember, um, and I'm not going to go too big into the trauma, but, but there was a lot of beatings, and, uh, and my mom would run in to rescue me, and then it would turn on her. And I, I remember him telling me that 99% of all of it was my fault, and so I remember trying to hold it in when he was doing it, you know, and I, I tried to be quiet so my mom didn't come in to save me, and, and it, it, it kind of set me off on, on a pace of uh, hopelessness at a really young age. I remember by the time I was 13, um, I was so used to the bullshit that I, I really didn't give a shit anymore. I was, I was kind of numb as a 13 year old. I learned that all I had to do was bolt, man. I, 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 I wasn't afraid of the beatings. The beatings were like, wasn't shit to me anymore. It was, I wasn't even afraid of him. He could sit there and yell at me and I, I would just be like out of it. I wouldn't do my schoolwork. I, I started ditching constantly. I was that 13 year old kid that none of the other parents wanted, uh, one of their kids around because I, I was, I was heinous. I mean, I was, I was bad for a 16 year old at that age, you know? And, and, um, so as I would like, uh, every time he would try to drop the hammer on me, I would run away from home. I would, uh, and my sister being older, had older friends that I could go stay with and they would kind of take care of me and I, and I could drink with them and they would smoke pot with me. And it, and it became this, like the, one of the few times I can remember as a kid being happy. Um, I, I loved it, you know, and uh, the problem was is, is um, wherever I'd go, he'd find me, and then he'd threaten police action over there, contributing to the delinquence of a minor, and uh, so it got so bad that they actually started sending me up to my old man's, and my old man's house was, uh, it was cool, you know, he was, he was really dysfunctional, but he wasn't about, you know, chewing my ass all the time and getting on me. But, but I, was, I was still at that point, I was, I was so dysfunctional, I, I, I still wouldn't go to school, I still wouldn't do any of the basic things that, that I needed to do in order to be successful with him, you know, and, and not to mention, um, I mean, these are some of my favorite times with my dad, he was such a heavy drinker um, that I'd get to tip him back with him a little bit if I got him buzzed enough, you know, I, I remember he used to tell me, um, he'd say, go mix me one, 50-50, don't try to save me, and that was... 50% vodka, 50% Kool-Aid, you know, and I, and I, and I feel, you know, I, I've had some guilt over this, but I would go about 60 to 70, 30, you know, because he, he was a dick, man. If the man was sober, he was a shaky prick and I couldn't, um, and I wanted to get to the good times, you know, and, and I mean, I would be 14 years old and we'd be sitting there on the weekend and, you know, uh, I would get to drink with him a little bit, smoke a cigarette. We'd be watching John Wayne. He'd be telling me stories. We'd be making all those pipe dream plans, you know, and, and uh, for quite a while I believed him. But, but once again, the problem was is the party ain't always going, you know, and I, and I couldn't keep, I was a kid. And uh, when he started finding out, you know, that I was flunking out of school and that I wasn't going, you know, he started trying to drop the hammer on me too. And the problem was at that point, if you told me anything, I'm bucking. I mean, it didn't matter what you tell me, um, where it was and the outcome, even if it meant going back to that shit house with my mom and that dude, it didn't matter to me. It was, it was, you aren't going to tell me what to do and I'm going to buck and I'm going to go. And, uh, he lived up in LA and it was a little bit of a worse spot to be running away from home at. So I remember I, uh, he, he, he kind of went at me and then, uh, I became a ward of the state and I started, they, you know, I, no one could control me. So I was in and out of juvenile hall and once 
that was always the threat that would get me to calm down. But once I did it, and anybody that's been locked up understands, it's once you get there and once you find out, you know, it, it's really nothing. Now it's just another outcome. Now it's just another thing that uh, almost like a, another resource, you know. I mean, um, and all through my, all through my teenage years, um, that, that kind of became the case. Uh, I got comfortable with the consequences. And um, I was always in and out of juvenile hall. Up here they call it DT. But, uh, yeah, and uh, on to the point where I was about 16 and I started, I started using meth and I started, um, and everybody was seeing such a huge difference in me. They couldn't lock me up at the time. And they were, like, at a loss for what to do with this kid. I, I know uh, my mom literally was probably, you know, looking forward to when I turned 18 and the prison would finally take me because she was, uh, she was just done. She had been sober for quite a bit of time. I remember they would make me go to AA meetings. Uh, out in California, they do these big potlucks. And uh, quite a few times I would go to these AA meetings with my friends because my friends were other people that were in AA's kids. And we all got busted getting loaded, you know, so we'd all be sitting there like, fuck. And, uh, and, uh, and that, that, that was my, you know, uh, looking back, it was a blessing because I've always had that in the back of my head as the answer, watching my mom get better that way. But uh, so anyhow, they came up with this new plan and it was, uh, it worked for me. It was another geographical change. My uncle was in the army up in uh, uh, St. Benning, Georgia. Fort Benning, Georgia, and uh, he was uh, living in Phoenix City, Alabama, and he, he wanted me to come up. Me and him were close before he went into the Army. He was kind of like my idol, and he, he kind of had a new approach with me that, that I liked. He, he was like, you can drink, but you got to work. You know, I, I already got another wife. I don't need another wife, you know, and so uh, up in Alabama, it wasn't really that hard to find a job. I was underage, and I, I got a job uh, at a steel shop at age 16 and I was working eight hours a day and after work I got to drink you know so it was it was pretty cool I was about it and uh and I felt like a man I I it was the first time I I realized I have one good thing and that's a work ethic they love me I could work you know I knew how to work um and so that went on for a while but the problem was even though my uncle is a drinker like I started making it a problem, you know. I, I started getting drunk with the guys at work before I got home, and so I'm already coming home shit-faced. His wife's looking at me like, what the, you know, what are we going to do with this? And and at, at this point in time, I don't know that, that I didn't understand that you don't argue with the man's wife, you know. So, so shit got pretty bad towards the end, you know. Like, I was getting drunk. They were trying to put a curve on it, and that's that's what you don't do to me is you do not try to control me, you know. And uh, so I started arguing with his wife a little bit. And I remember the first time he yelled at me and it was like, you know, and uh, I've never, I'm, I'm not like a tough guy. What I am is like one of those dogs that got the shit kicked out of them for a long time. So if you try to pet them, they just start biting the shit out of you. So the second this man yelled at me, you know, I'm swinging at him and he's in the fucking army. He's a big, tough dude, you know, and uh he started kicking the shit out of me and, and it became a regular thing. We kept getting drunk and he kept beating me up because I kept trying to fight him and uh, he didn't know what to do with me. So I ended up having to take that 3,000 mile walk of shame back to California. And, um, and at that point, um, I was completely hopeless. I, I remember my mom tried to spit AA game at me. She started trying. Now I understand what she was doing, trying to get me to write in a diary, trying to um, all sorts of different little methods that when you ain't ready to hear it, you're just not ready to hear it. And I, uh, so at that point, getting that low, you know, I was, um, I knew what everybody thought of me. And, uh, and you think, you think at that point, I would, I would want to do something different, but, but the only thing I learned is that I could work. So I started working and, uh, and my mom tried the same trick, pay rent, but, I had work ethic, but I didn't have any commitment to me, and um, I couldn't. I couldn't work very long. And being back in California, I was back with the uh, the old crowd, and 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 it was a criminal crowd, and and we were we were doing a lot of shit, you know, a lot a lot of shit that led into, uh, you know, grew throughout the years, and and um, we all started getting locked up together. And as I got older, you know, um, the the junior camp started out. I started going to uh, jail. 
and I, and I was doing jail time and I was and I was getting comfy with jail time and, and actually I'm not going to I'm not going to speak on the prison and jail a whole lot because it's always been the comfortable uh, a spot for me it really is like I, I caught myself the other day watching uh, a show where the dude was sitting in jail reading a book and it kind of looked good to me you know it was like I was surprised but it's like fuck you know it's like a fitness camp. You go in there, you work out, you eat, you're, you're playing cards, you know, you're joking. And, I mean, in California, there's a few other things involved with it, but it's still, it's like there's a comfort to it. And there ain't no phones and there ain't no bills and there ain't nobody judging you and you just, you're just in your spot, you know. And uh, so, so yeah, uh, that, that, that became the way for me. And it was in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. I remember... Uh, by the time I was uh, around 21, uh, it, it wasn't working for me. I, I ended up just getting out. I did a, I did a little chunk of time, not, not a big one, but a good chunk. And uh, I, uh, I was out for just a couple months, and I was running, running pretty hard, and I had all these new connections from the guys I was down with. And uh, a debt caught up to me, and... Uh, as I was leaving uh, one of those trap houses, I got I got thumped. These guys caught up to me and they they bludgeoned me. Uh, they they got me so bad uh, that I, I woke up by the back sliding glass door and they're trying to wipe the blood off me so they can drag me in the house. Um, my face was mangled. I had both sides of my ribs were broke. I had uh, black and blue welts all over my body from uh, I guess they were kicking at me. I got lucky. At, because the the Mexican guys, the neighbors seen it and chased them off with knives. Um, I think they would have killed me probably, you know. But that was the first first time where I was uh, I was ready for some change. I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I showed up at my mom's house, and uh, she was in tears looking at me, and she's begging me, "Go to Utah, go to Utah," you know. And Utah turned out to be just what I was thinking it would be, and I, and I was like, I, I don't want to go to Utah, but, you know, I didn't have much going on out there, and I didn't know if those guys were done with me, and I didn't, you know, and I, and I didn't want to have to, I, I, did, I was tired. I, I was, uh, for the first time, tired and looking for something different. And uh, my sister lived up here. My uncle had gotten out of the Army, and he lived up here, and once again, they were, they were ready to open their arms up to me and let me, let me come in. And so I, I came up. I, I came up from California to Utah. I had a little Toyota to sell, and I remember uh, the uh, front window was busted out of it because I was uh, tweaked out and I couldn't find, I couldn't get into it, and I locked my keys in there. So I just busted the window. I tried taping it up, and I'm driving up here in the winter, and it, it was literally like Dumb and Dumber. I was in that car just. <laughs> driving up here I was purple by the time I got to pay pace in Utah and um and I'm pulling into this town and I'm thinking these fucking people told me there's going to be a bunch of work up here and I'm looking at this town and there's not even a stoplight I mean it blew my mind I was at a four-way stop there's a cop right in front of me at the other side and he does this on a steering wheel as we're passing each other waves at me and it was like what I I was I was blown away you know um so, uh, so yeah, that, that became my first geographical change where I thought I could uh, do something different. I, um, I came up here. Um, I did get working instantly. There was a lot of work up here. I, I remember I was laying pipe, underground pipe up in Highland, and um, that was an experience. Uh, I had my uncle and, and my aunt. They were, they were hip to me now, so they were like, we're going to watch the drinking, but we could still drink, you know, and... And my uncle, he wasn't like an angel. He had a problem, so we were still sneaking off, sneaking bottles in under his wife's nose and still having nights where we went too far and didn't come back. And, and it, it just became another fiasco for me. I, I, I started drinking so heavy that uh, it, be, it, it became a pretty good problem. I ended up getting arrested for fighting with the neighbors one night. Um, I mean, they, they once again were sick of me. But as I was working, I, I started developing friends out here, and I started meeting a lot of people. And actually, this is probably the only stretch of time where, where it was working for me. It was actually fun. You know, I, I, I had a group of friends. We were drinking on the weekends. We were chasing girls. And, and I am, I'm one awkward dude, unless you throw alcohol at me. And then I think I'm like Don Juan. I can really... Like, I, I feel like I'm a pimp. I can walk up and talk to you and think that you love me. Otherwise, I got my head down. I'm nervous, you know. And... Uh, 
and I was just meeting girls and we were having fun and, and it was like, oh shit, this is what normal life's like, you know, and, and, and that went for a while and I, I remember uh, there was a night I was at a Halloween party and I was getting booted out for uh, fighting and, and my bride-to-be, the, the, she had a good picker, grabbed a hold of me on the way out the door and we, we left together and I, I met her for the first time and, uh, and uh, I guess we hit it off. Like, like when I sobered up, she, she really wasn't my style, and, um, <laughs> but she had a couple positives, you know, like this became a prerequisite for me. She had a house, and, uh, and I, never, I never had one of those, <laughs> so I, you know, I was like ready to be a grown-up, you know, and, uh, and I, I, uh, I moved in with her pretty quick, and that became a pretty, pretty standard thing for me as the years went, but I moved in with her right away. She had a little two-year-old son. Um, I remember he called me Dustin Dad, Dutton Dad, and uh, and that was cool. But uh, you know, I, I wasn't in a place to be around a kid. I had no clue how to love a kid. I I I, I had no clue what a kid needed. You know, I was a foul-mouthed person. Um, I threw temper tantrums. I was I was real proud of myself because unlike unlike my stepdad, I I, di I didn't hit women and I didn't hit kids. So what I would do is every time I was mad, I would break shit. I would punch holes in the walls all over the house. And uh, I mean, we had pictures hanging up about eye level everywhere. And uh, and I and I I at the time in my head, I thought that wasn't just as bad, you know. And and the worst part was is this son of a bitch stepdad of mine kept coming out in me. He kept. I kept becoming him, and the more I became him, the more I hated myself, you know, and, uh, and things were going well, so, so we got married, and, uh, yeah, and uh, that, that, that was, uh, once again, another thing I shouldn't have done. Um, it was just, I, I didn't like her. I, I don't think she'll ever be here, so we'll be all right. But I didn't like her. I couldn't get along with her. And but I, the only thing I liked is she was always there when I got out of jail. She would put money on my books, and and she would put up with my shit. And I and I and uh, and I did a lot of stuff that I didn't realize how bad I was going to feel later to her. You know, I, I was a serial cheater. Um, I was uh, I would constantly take off. She wasn't sure. You know, she was constantly calling hospitals, jails. Um, we ended up. Uh, I ended up getting her pregnant. Uh, we had a son and a daughter together. And once again, uh, you know, no clue how to do it. But I was ready to try, you know. So I started trying to sober up. And I, and I was able to get a good stretch. But um, I had gone to a doctor at the time. So I got this perfect, like, prescription cocktail to where I could stay off meth for a while, for a good while, you know. And I was on Percocet and uh, uh, Oxycontin and... And I was on uh, Soma and uh, what you call it, Clonopin. And so th that that worked for a while. I remember I was actually coaching uh, accelerated baseball. I was I was being the dad that I thought you know was great, but I was a disciplinarian. I was uh, I was that guy I hated it, it and uh, I hated it when it would come out in me. You know I. Uh, I was the guy that was about the grades and about the cleaning up after yourself and about the respect. When I never put a day of it in, I was expecting it from them. And uh, I caused a lot of wreckage. The, the, the end of that marriage kind of winded down at a point where um, I went, I had took so many somas that um, this is what I remember of the evening. I remember uh, running outside, getting tased. I remember in booking, smacking the window, yelling obscenities. And I remember a bunch of cops carrying me into a drunk tank. I woke up the next day and realized I had ruined my life. Uh, I had punched a hole through my son's door. He escaped through the uh, back window, ran, called the cops. Uh, I got arrested for this, uh, what do you call it when you break your own shit? Uh, criminal mischief and um, domestic violence. And, uh, and it, it all toppled after that. At that point, um, they were given just enough break away from me to, to, to say, hey, don't come back. Um, you know, I, I wanted her to lift the protective order. You know, I'm, I'm sober, I'm sorry, she didn't. Um, and, and, uh, and I took that 
I took that shame and I rolled with it. You know, I, I disappeared. I, uh, it was something so shameful that I, that I couldn't show my face again. I, I mean, I, uh, it, was, it was one of the many big things in my lives that, that I used to explode in the wrong direction. Uh, and it went on for, for, for quite a few years. Um, I went, uh, after that it was a lot of in and out of jails. Uh, at this time, my mom got sick with cancer. Um, and I regret this to this day, I, I could not come around her. It was like I had, I had been holding back emotions for so many years that if I, if I let one out, it would come out in the biggest way and it would destroy me. It would, it would flood me. I, I, if I would let one tear drop, I couldn't stop crying. If, and, I, and I couldn't go around my mom because she brought up emotions. And uh, I spent a lot of time away from her while she was in her uh, chemo and stuff. I remember I got locked up for eight months out here and uh, she came and picked me up. And when I seen her, uh, it looked like she'd aged 20 years. She was, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, I couldn't deal with it. So I, I uh, you know, we went out to lunch. I gave her all the good, good things I was gonna do and then I bolted again. And um, this, this never stopped. Uh, she passed away. I was, uh, she never got to see me sober. Um, That's all I have to say about that. I'm going to move on. but uh, <laughs> um, And then uh, moving on. So, yeah, I, uh, I was running pretty hard. I, I was running through all these, these, these half relationships, whatever, whatever girl I could run into, whatever way I could get my mind off of the shit that was going on, you know. And uh, uh, came to a point in time where my, my dad got sick too. And... Uh, he ended up with cirrhosis of the liver and bladder cancer, and I, and I was on the, I was on the run at the time, and he didn't have a lot of time left, and so I, I thought, you know, I'm gonna go see him. He was down in Vegas, and I went down and seen him and told him I'm probably gonna be in jail when you die, you know. So I had to, uh, like, it was weird. I had to say goodbye to him while he was alive because I knew it was gonna catch up to me, and I couldn't stay in Vegas because I didn't have no plugs down there. So I, I came back. I said goodbye to my father. Uh, and, and it was prophecy. He, he passed a week before I got out. Um, and at that time, right when I got out, it was about a week later, I met, I met my, next, uh, my next love, you know, uh, the one, at least one that I would keep, you know. And uh, she had a house. So <laughs> I, uh, I moved in right away. And, uh, you know, and on came the fiasco. Only this one, this one I did like a little more. Uh, <laughs> And I, I don't want to sound like a pig. I, I'm just, I, but I was. I was a selfish, um, a selfish person, and, I, and everybody was just a tool to me. I used, I used people to get where I needed to get, get, and to not feel anything, you know. And, and that's what worked for me. And this girl, uh, she had a spot. I moved in, and, uh, and I, and I upped her game. She was, she was a little bit of an addict, but I mean, like when I moved in. We really got it going on, and, and, and things went upside down, and she lost her younger daughter. And, uh, and then, of course, after I blew her whole house up, I, I got locked up again and went away. And, and this went on for, for quite a while. It went off and on. And uh, f at, there was a point where um, she, got, she, got, uh, she was pregnant. And um, at this point, when I got her pregnant, I had so much guilt from um, my daughter and my son that I haven't mentioned a lot to this point, but but uh, I went years. I mean, I went years. They were getting older, and I, and I just disappeared. And I didn't want to screw up with this kid. I, I didn't want to do the same thing. You know, I, I didn't know uh, it was going to be a little girl. But um, I wanted something different, and I, I remember she was about three months pregnant. And... Uh, I, I had kind of led the charge. I went and I checked myself into a detox. And uh, I, I went from detox into the program and, uh, and I cleaned up and she followed suit a couple weeks later and, and uh, it, it kind of worked out for a while. We had a kid. It was my first real attempt at AA. Um, I, I, I was ready for change. I wanted to be a good father. I still, 
I still wasn't able to address all those issues I had and the hole in me. See, I, if you take all those drugs and that alcohol out of me, there's still that hole. Now I just have nothing to fill it, you know, and, uh, and I didn't fill that. I didn't, I wasn't as open to suggestions and I wasn't as open to doing the steps and to doing things honestly. And, um, and, and the fact that I didn't do that was the fact that I, I, uh, I wasn't able to get what this program offers. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's clear to me now that like, like how important every bit of this program is and how important sponsorship and steps and, um, and working with others is because without that light, I am, I'm, I'm just, I'm just still running around with a hole in me, you know? Um, so anyhow, uh, for the first couple of years of my daughter's life, things were, things were, um, going good. I, I've never been clean two years in my life. I, I, my sober date's October 3rd, 2022. I've got 15 months. I've never had two years. Uh, so I was off and on in usage, but I was able to hold it down enough because I continually wanted better for myself. I wanted to be around my little girl. Um, but I, but I, I couldn't follow the simple program enough to get it. And, um, and it caught up with me. Uh, it, from from her second year on, I spent. Um, I I didn't I missed the last uh, three birthdays, three Christmases, three Thanksgivings. You know I was locked up for them. I uh, I was in and out of her life, causing causing a lot of problems for her because I was such a present like presence not the word I was so like in love with this little girl that I was always all over her when I was free. So what that did to her is it. it it, when I would disappear here and there, keep getting locked up, it just screwed her up. It just messed her up, you know. And, and her mom, I got I got a lot of a lot I could say about her, but uh, she uh, she kept she she held her down at least for the, all those times I disappeared. Um, and every time I would get locked up, her mom I would get out, and her mom was a little worse off, you know. Her mom had to go out there and fend for herself and. Uh, and her her addiction was getting worse and worse, and her uh, ability to be honest was getting worse and worse. And um, and there was a there was just like it was there was zero trust. The relationship was taking a dive, and uh, uh, and and we had this little girl, and I, and I had the predicament of what can I do? I need to get away from her, but but she's got my little girl, and uh, it skipping through a lot of a lot of things that happened um it finally got bad enough for both of us where where i where we did split up for a while and um you know being apart from her she had my daughter and i wasn't sure what to do you know i uh i wanted to see my little girl but i was homeless i was running around uh, stealing catalytic converters and uh <laughs> and uh trying to raise up enough money to get her, I remember a Barbie, I wanted to get her the Barbie thing, but I, I could never come up with quite enough, you know? And so, uh, so there, there was this night where I, I, I did come up with enough for a hotel room. And I remember she was staying with this dude that was uh, slinging fentanyl out of his house. And I, uh, I got enough uh, money for a hotel room and I thought it was for two nights. And so I went and picked her up and, and me and her got to hang out in this hotel that night my partner with the truck took off he was supposed to come back did not he also didn't pay for two days uh like i thought and so the next day they came pounding on the door and we're going to call the cops on me well well good father that i am i did have quite a few things i didn't want the cops to see that day so i was uh uh in a panic i was packing up uh trying to get everything together and, and here's here's the uh Here's a, I literally, the first time God worked in my life was uh, we got out of there and my phone was busted. So I had no vehicle, I had no money, and I had no phone to call for help. And uh, we sat at McDonald's for a while, and then uh, I didn't know what to do, so I, uh, I threw her on my shoulders, and, and we went for a long-ass walk. And I weighed about 120 pounds at the time, and... Uh, I was on my, she was on my shoulders and we were walking to the train station and, and then we got to the train station and we took it to Provo and uh, I didn't pay for a ticket, judge me if you want. <laughs> and uh, no, uh, and then uh, we got to Provo and, and I got up and I threw her on my shoulders again and we went on another walk for a couple miles to, to a friend's house. And I remember I was walking down the street and uh, she was on my shoulders and I was, I was in tears. I'm like, 
I, I, uh, I just realized that, that like not only was I uh, harmful to myself, but I was harmful to her and anyone around me. I was not, I wasn't only bad for her, I was doing them harm by being around them. And uh, so I got, uh, got to this girl's house and I'm really grateful to her. She was, she at least took me in, you know, I mean, uh, she was selling bath salt out of her house, but she was nice enough to let us crash on the couch. And uh, I uh, decided right there that I, that I needed something different. And um, I remember I wouldn't give her back to her mom till we found somewhere that we could drop Abby and I was going to go detox. And I, and uh, so we found somewhere to drop my daughter off. And um, I did, I went to detox. I went into a detox. I, uh, I was kicking fentanyl and uh, you name it. And uh, I was in there for a week. I, I got, went from there to the Haven. And uh, when I got to the Haven, they, uh, uh, I called my PO to let him know I was in uh, treatment, you know, pat on my back. And he said it was too late. I already had uh, warrants, you know, so I had to, uh, I had to make a decision right there. You know, it was like, oh God, I don't want to keep running. I really did want change. I, uh, I, uh, for the first time in my entire life, I, I didn't make them earn their money. I, I turned myself into jail the next day. And, uh, I, and I, while I was there, I, I, I was literally spent, my whole goal was to be alive next year for my daughter. That's all I wanted. And uh, I ended up getting love. I only did like, I think like three months, you know, and uh, I got out, got moved over to uh, Foothill. And, uh, and I was about it. I, uh, I was doing my thing and uh, I was a little bit of a pink cloud for a second and then I lost custody of my daughter uh, just, just over three months sober. Uh, her mom took her for a night and uh, she was in the bathroom so long at a bed and breakfast, the cops came and, uh, and so we lost custody of her. And, and this whole time I'm sober and uh, the amount of pain I was going through, I had to find ways to uh, get through it. and. Uh, that's where my strength in this program started. I, I remember uh, the, the acceptance page on 417. I read that three, four times a day, you know, uh, because it, it, it told me that I was, I was, I was, where I was at was where I was supposed to be, uh, that, you know, that, that it was worth it. And uh, I remember I was like that, that do-gooder in rehab, you know, instead of the dude that's not, not gonna rat on the guy for having chew, you know, I, I was like literally, holding meetings and uh, I just wanted to get my daughter back. And, uh, and I, took, I took everything real serious and uh, I found self-love in that, you know. Um, went through a lot of hard stuff. Uh, watching her in, uh, God damn it, if I'm gonna boob in front of all you, I'm gonna be pissed. Uh, uh, watching her in those two-way two mirrors, you know, in that supervised visitation, it was, uh, it broke me and uh, yeah, so I uh, I just kept trying, man. And uh, when I got out of when I got out of rehab, I uh, I hit meetings. I hit meetings like religiously, and uh, I went back to an old sponsor at first, and uh, and I just wasn't getting it with him. But it was it, he's a he's a beast as a sponsor. But but he there was a there was a familiar way I was able to work around what I was supposed to do, and uh, so I. So I went outside my comfort zone and I picked somebody that I thought might uh, challenge me. I was wrong. He's not that good, but um, it worked. <laughs> it worked, you know. Um, it, it, it worked. Uh, I worked the steps. I uh, I learned a lot in my fourth step. Um, I learned how how much faith I put in people that are going to break me, and then I get mad at the end when they break faith with me. You know, it's like. It's like, uh, it's just another way of being a victim, you know? And, uh, and the biggest thing I've, I've learned, I think, is, is I, haven't needed, I haven't needed anyone, you know? Like, I've been okay alone, and that's, that had to happen in order to stay sober because I wasn't okay alone before, and I kept going back to the same old same. And, uh, and you know, uh, raising a daughter by yourself and being alone, it's like sometimes you just want to, like, talk to an adult, you know? And it's like, but uh, God, I'm so fucking grateful for what I have today. It's, uh, I never thought I had this in me. I got, uh, my older children are back in my life now. My son, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, 
he calls me, uh, you know, he calls me dad, tells me he loves me. I just got uh, back with my daughter, which was a really tough one. I mean, I, uh, the second she gave me an inch, I, I stalk her on Facebook, man. The other, the other day she, she posted, uh, it was actually Friday, if anybody would bring me some Del Taco, I'd love you forever. I'm like, hungry? <laughs> Bust down there. I brought her Chick-fil-A, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and, uh, and they're starting to see it. I'm actually able to uh, uh, be there when they need me. She's pregnant, and she's telling me she loves me, and I'm going to be a grandpa. And, uh, I mean, none of this would have been possible without the steps, without uh, my higher power, which um, a little bit on that. My higher power isn't, isn't the dude with the beard. It's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a book because that never worked for me. My, my higher power is, uh, is, is my day. You know, um, my sponsor told me, uh, because my luck was so good, you know, that, that when bad shit happened to it, it had to be for a reason, right? And he told me to start acting like everything that's happening to me happens for me, you know, not, not, not against me. And, and, and so, like, I've developed my higher power is someone who is, uh, he's just my every day. It's, it's everything. It's, it's everything in front of me. And, uh, and uh, it's making that right decision when I want to lie because that's instantly what I want to do. I mean, I still drive around and catch myself spotting trailers without a lock on them. And I'm like, Shh. you know, I mean, I, I mean, my, my instincts aren't good. Uh, but this program switched me around to where, like, I'm actually somebody that I can look in the mirror now. You know, um, I, I, uh, I struggle feeling like I'm not good enough as a dad, but, but shit, man, we're getting through it. Um, life's just good. I'm going to have to cut it a little short because I, I, I just don't know what else to say, but I'm grateful for this program. I'm grateful for all of you. Thank you.